We're heading for the Munros with Nicholas Crane. Welcome to the mountains of Scotland, the greatest, the wildest landscape in Britain. They're a mecca for hill walkers. Tens of thousands come here every year. And the key destination, the only destination for many, are the mountains over 3,000 feet. The peaks we know today as the Munros. The Munros are in a class of their own. They are Scotland's highest mountains and they define this land. Hundreds of summits that stretch for over a hundred miles across the highlands and islands. And getting to the top of the Munros has become an obsession with a name of its own, Munro Bagging the quest to climb all Scotland's highest peaks. I love these mountains too. I've walked them since I was a teenager. I know their shapes and their names like old friends. From the legendary Ben Nevis and Sherlock, Leagach. Skur Alistair to the secretive and obscure Bentarsun Spijan Milach or Skur Ruhr. Their very names are mantra which stirs the hearts of those who have been enraptured by them. On whose slopes friendships are forged on whose summits lifelong journeys begin and end. Done it. From razor-sharp ridges to desolate plateaus to gaunt cliffs, they are among Europe's most varied mountains. Yet, incredibly, a little over a hundred years ago, they were virtually unknown. Until Sir Hugh Munro. So who was Munro, the man who brought order to these mountains and who gave birth to an obsession that has lasted a hundred years? His story is one of discovery, altitude and intrigue. It tells us what happened when the Victorian passion for rationalising the natural world collided with an all-consuming love of mountains. This is the story of Sir Hugh Munro, the magnificent peaks that bear his name, and the people who have been possessed by them. I'm in the Northwest Highlands. On my way towards one of the mountains I love best anywhere in the world. And Sherlock. There's nothing like being high up on a mountain. I've walked and climbed among the world's greatest mountain ranges. But I always come back here. I think of these magnificent mountains as home. My father introduced me to these mountains as a teenager. He used to come up here every winter. Just over there, I had the adventure of a lifetime. But it isn't really one I'd like to repeat. These peaks have been trodden by countless walkers and climbers. They're well past being what you'd call wilderness. but I know only too well how easy it is to underestimate them. This is a place where violent winds, mist and snow 
can quickly turn a day out into a life or death epic. This mountain here and Shellac bit me good and proper when I was a youngster. A group of us had climbed the entire ridge in perfect winter conditions. It was plastered in snow and ice. Everything was going according to plan until we reached the final peak. That one up there covered with crags. The mist came down and we just couldn't find a route down through the icy rocks. Well, we descended the gully for 3,000 feet on a rope and 30 hours later got back to where we started thanks to one of these, an accurate map. It's amazing to think then that a hundred years ago there were no detailed, reliable descriptions of this landscape. The Victorians were fanatical explorers. The world's great unknowns were falling one by one to the methodical tyranny of the map makers. By the 1880s, the course of the river Congo had been traced. The Matterhorn had been climbed for the first time and the height of Mount Everest had been measured. But thousands of miles from the Himalayas, much closer to us, was a vast area still relatively unknown to adventure-obsessed Victorian Britain, the Scottish Highlands. We were waiting for an explorer in our own land, someone who could reveal the secrets of our very own mountains to the wider world. But that pioneer had yet to step forward. Let me show you how sketchy our knowledge was of these mountains 120 years ago. Here are some maps of that era. On this one, one mile of reality is compressed into one inch on the map. And at first glance, it looks quite modern. But when you look closer, you realize how much is missing or questionable. Here's a mountain with a summit, according to the map, at 2,750 feet. Well, there it is over there, and in reality, it's over 3,000 feet high. In other words, the map tells me that there shouldn't be anything above the height of my hand. It's just a complete blank. The thought of navigating through these mountains with maps like this is fairly terrifying. They're just all full of holes, and there are no convenient guidebooks to fill in the gaps. No reliable, detailed record of this landscape existed. And without that, there could be no widespread knowledge of what was out here. Entire mountain massifs were known only to the locals. These were the days when the great landowners prevented ordinary people from crossing their territories. As a result, no one person had climbed sufficiently far and wide to get a true picture of Scotland's mountains. In fact, nobody even knew how many mountains there were. Not even the newly founded Scottish Mountaineering Club. Some of the members already had impressive alpine climbing experience. And from its beginning in 1889, there was an air of exploratory zeal about the club. The founders knew their homegrown hills and glens were a whole new world waiting to be discovered. And one of the club's first resolutions was to address the appalling ignorance of their own backyard by having Scotland's mountains listed in a scientific way. To undertake this, they turned to one of the club's own members. His name was Hugh Thomas Munro, heir to his father's estate in the foothills of the eastern Cairngorms. Hello, Robin. Oh, hi, Nick. Very nice Very to meet you. I've joined mountaineer and historian Robin Campbell to help me understand the origins of Munro's task. It, it looks like that in 1890, uh, Monroe was given the task, either by the committee or by the first editor, Joe Stott, of gathering information about every hill over 3,000 feet in Scotland. But why 3,000 feet? Why was he only interested in mountains 3,000 feet high? The Highlands are uh, eroded plateau, eroded by glaciation, and uh, probably the low point of that original plateau would be round about 3,000 feet. So it's an accident of geology in the Ice Age that Scotland's mountains tend to cluster around 3,000 feet. And it's a nice round number. What exactly did he, did he do? Uh, for each hill, he collected basic information. He collected its height, its name, where it was, what county it sat in, where it was best ascended from. 